Number 10, Brainiac, the collector of worlds. Kind of like those weirdos who collect snow globes. Brainiac is considered one of Superman's stronger and actually not boring foes. Brainiac's level of intellect supersedes humans by several centuries of advanced knowledge. He's so smart that his intelligence actually creates his other powers, if that even makes sense. For example, he can interconnect his consciousness with other computer systems, possess other beings, and even transfer knowledge and information to himself from others. Now, the original Brainiac's purpose was to capture cities and assimilate knowledge in order to gain power. Part of his operating procedure is collecting civilizations for study and preserving his knowledge of alien species so that he remains the most supreme being in the universe, and then destroying planets and galaxies in his wake to prevent the knowledge from spreading. Now, because of his ability to interface with networks and possess living organisms, he has become basically omniscient. Brainiac has gained the ability to spread like a virus and hold massive influence over entire populations. It has even learned from his encounters with Superman and developed countermeasures to thwart the Man of Steel. Number 9, Galactus. The being formerly known as Galen of the planet Ta lived before the modern cosmos, in the previous cosmos actually. Galen gestated with the sentience of the universe for billions of years, transforming into the devourer of worlds, finding sustenance by ingesting entire planets, preferably those with living sentient beings that have much more energy for him to harness. When Galactus destroys and consumes planets, he is sort of bringing balance to the universe. Kind of like how life is given and taken every day on Earth, which makes him an essential part of the universe. He's known for the destruction of the Skrull Empire and has attempted to devour the Earth so many freaking times. And I guess other planets for that matter too, or whatever. Galactus is also famous for his heralds, such as the Silver Surfer and the Cosmic Ghost Rider, and so many others. And while they are all powerful beings themselves, usually even before they gain the herald power boost, they don't hold a candle to Galactus himself. His only caveat is that Galactus's power depends on his planet's consumption. So a weakened Galactus has been killed before, but if he eats like four or more planets, he's been able to defeat multiple mad celestials all by himself. He's powered by food, and I think pretty much all of us can get behind that. Number eight, Thanos. Thanos, who made his debut in Iron Man number 55 in February of 1973, has only one goal, and that goal is to conquer the galaxy. If you are only familiar with his movie adaptation, then you may not know that comics Thanos is not really much of an altruistic dude. The Mad Titan doesn't seek to eliminate half of life in the known universe in order to create a better one. He simply wanted to impress a girl. But not in the same way you might think. Thanos has a thing for death. In fact, he fell in love with the Mistress Death, who is the physical embodiment of death in Marvel Comics. Now, to prove his love, he was going to destroy all the life in the universe, and that's what led to him assembling the Infinity Stones and trying to wield the Cosmic Cube. He's really just a cosmic level serial unaliver, if you want to call him that. Thanos was born on Titan, a moon of Saturn, and is technically an Eternal, but he possessed a deviant gene which made him very different looking. Now he was bullied for this as a child, and as such, Thanos distances himself from his society, and even starts dissecting animals, doing all that creepy stuff. He has gone far in his obsession with Mistress Death, kidnapping his own mother and dissecting her, training his daughter to become an assassin, and even sending a targeted nuclear strike at his own homeworld. He has the power of telekinesis and matter manipulation, has superhuman intellect, can master any technology, time travel, teleport, and is an incredibly powerful and scary dude. At number Number seven is Despero. Another classic villain, Despero first appears in 1960's Justice League of America, the self-titled comic book series. So even though Starro is known as the first villain that the JLA ever faced, Despero is the first villain in the official Justice League storyline. So now, I'm not going to claim that Despero has the most original design. He could risk coming off as a pretty generic looking alien bad guy, but his powers are pretty impressive. With flight, telepathy and mind control in his arsenal. He'd be like the evil telepathic Red Hulk of the DCEU, which might actually be a cool villain for the League to be faced with in an upcoming project. At number six is Vandal Savage. This guy is known as an immortal caveman who has lived 50,000 years to the present day and having taken part in many significant events in Earth's history. And honestly, I just love this backstory. I think Vandal Savage could be used to ground the DCEU in a way that it's been trying to do for a 
while now. With the Man of Steel, Justice League, and Suicide Squad franchises not quite hitting like the studios hoped they would, it might be time they bring in a character that has everything to do with Earth and the history of humankind. Perhaps they could weave in new villainous motivations based on his experience witnessing the evils of humanity throughout history, or maybe, I don't know, how the Earth has fallen victim to climate change at the hands of humans during his extended lifetime. I mean, he's been in support of some of the worst tyrants in the history of the world, so his connection with the human plight of evil could really bring a grounding presence to a DCEU project in a way we maybe haven't seen before. At number 5 is Grail. Daughter of Darkseid and Amazonian Marina the Black, Grail is a much more modern DC villain and she could add a really interesting angle to the DCEU. Partly because she actually opposes her father, Darkseid, on many fronts, which adds for some cool internal conflict within the villain ranks. But mostly because she could be woven into Wonder Woman's history due to their common Amazonian heritage. I think adding a villain who is linked to such a major character as Wonder Woman was a great great idea in the comics, and if Grail makes it into the DCEU, we can not only learn more about the family history and therefore the humanity of Darkseid, but also about Wonder Woman's family history as well. Number 3, Dark Phoenix. The Phoenix Force is a multiversal entity that represents the sum total of all life that has ever, currently does, and will ever exist in the multiverse. It has a constant source of power that will pretty much never cease to exist. The young Jean Grey had a friend named Annie who died in a car crash and when Jean tapped into Annie's dying mind, she was overwhelmed by what it meant to die. She sent out a kind of psychic signal that the Phoenix Force picked up on from space. And that psychic signal showed that Jean was a perfect host for the Phoenix. When they eventually did bond in the Phoenix Saga, they temporarily became the Dark Phoenix after the entity felt intense human emotions like love and hate and loss, something it never felt before. The Dark Phoenix has immense telepathic and telekinetic abilities, being pure psychic energy. But more importantly, she had control over matter itself. She gives Jason Wingard cosmic awareness, completely overwhelming his brain and defeats the X-Men hella quick before she flies off across the cosmos, destroys a whole star, dooming an alien race to extinction. She can wipe out the Earth and the solar system easily if she wanted to. The Phoenix is an intense threat and has been involved in so many stories. Number 2, The Beyonder. The Beyonder is a singular entity with no duplicate versions of himself in other universes, similar to the Phoenix. And a lot like the Phoenix, Beyonder is basically like a baby in that he is a younger member of a race called the Beyonders that are a near omnipotent alien race from a dimension outside of the multiverse. He is himself basically a whole universe. It's really hard to explain. But as he observes Earth and the Marvel Universe and the various races, he grows kind of curious and the Beyonder decides to study and analyze life and humanity, good and evil, and conflict. And to that purpose, he pits Earth's mightiest heroes and villains against each other in the Secret Wars. Now he did this by destroying an entire system of planets and creating battle world from the remains and from parts of Earth. So that's one level of power. Beyonder's powers surpass that of Eternity and the Living Tribunal, and he is capable of manipulating reality to his will, being able to pretty much do whatever he wants and grant himself any power he wants. It's more nuanced than that, but it's incredibly difficult to explain, and I only have a limited amount of time, so sorry. Number 1, The Anti-Monitor. The Anti-Monitor was created by Marv Wolfman, George Perez, and Jerry Ordway, and made its debut in DC's Crisis on Infinite Earths series. But his story actually begins billions of years ago with the creation of the multiverse. When a scientist named Krona, who is a guardian of the universe on the Green Lantern world of Oa, tries to use a device that would allow him to witness creation itself, a massive explosion occurs which basically alters the creation of the universe, giving birth to the multiverse. Among the countless alternate realities created in this incident was the Antimatter Universe, which is the birthplace of the Anti-Monitor. Now the Anti-Monitor embodies evil and seeks to conquer all of existence, while his brother, the Monitor, embodies goodness and watches over life. But that was changed in the New 52 and then again in DC Rebirth. But I gotta tell you what this character can do. The Anti-Monitor is a being of extraordinary power who feeds on the energies of destroyed universes. Now these energies further increase his power, allowing him to manipulate reality and even travel through time. 
He can also unleash his energy as bolts or shock waves to attack his opponents. The Anti Monitor possesses incredible strength, stamina, and durability, and can even grow to be hundreds of meters tall. He also has an army of shadow demons from the antimatter universe at his command. However, the extent of the anti monitor's power is dependent on his energy levels, which can be drained in order to weaken him. Still, only another cosmic being like the monitor or the spectre is capable of opposing the anti monitor at full power. And even they need help from some of DC's top heroes to put him down for good. At number 10, we have Felix Faust. Although he's more of a classic character that might come off a bit campy, I think he still deserves a spot on the list. One of the reasons for that is that Faust would be a perfect candidate for the DCEU to explore explore the world of magic that exists in the comics, considering his power set. Felix Faust is able to access certain magical powers through his demonic familiars, giving him telepathy, summoning the dead, illusions, and much more. This could offer DC a way to cash in on the interest that the public clearly has for magic powers after the success of Doctor Strange and Scarlet Witch in the Marvel Universe. Although, in this case, the character would be a villain. And despite the fact that he looks kind of cartoonish, we've seen comic adaptations modernize or cinemify, if you will, crazier characters before. At number 9 is Prometheus. What's unique about this entry is that Prometheus doesn't actually have any superpowers, which could be a cool opportunity for DC to explore the human side of a villain, like Marvel did with Thanos, for instance, which I think worked really well. And honestly, for a human character only using armor and technology to get as powerful as Prometheus does, he would be a very interesting DCEU character to see how he gets to that point of power and how he is capable of taking on the Justice League head to head. With his super advanced computerized helmet, he's able to download knowledge such as fighting styles and much more into his mind and learn new skills immediately. And this allows the character to grow in power exponentially which offers for a cool arc in, say, a long-running TV series, perhaps. I also just think Prometheus looks so cool that he needs to be featured in a live-action setting. At number 8 is Amazo. Amazo is a classic Justice League villain, and he still holds up, other than his name. His name is a bit corny, but he was introduced back in 1960, so what else would we expect? Credited as the very first android in the world, Amazo was created by Professor Ivo, sort of like a more humanoid version of Ultron, except he's created by a villain with the intention of making him evil. He's also got a very impressive power where he can absorb the powers and skills of others in his immediate vicinity, which gives this villain a lot of potential as a serious threat in the DCEU. Maybe he he'd be more of a mini boss type villain, but I think it would make a lot of sense that he would appear in the DCU just based on his history with the JLA and his crazy power set. At number 7 we have Doomsday. The primary change with Doomsday isn't something that's been gained, but something that's been lost. A very notable power of his actually, and that is his hyper adaptability. Ability. In fact, I would even argue that this was his main power. And what it meant was he could learn from past losses in battle and change his physiology to prevent himself from being killed in the same way twice. I don't know why this has been dropped because aside from it being the defining characteristic of Doomsday, it was just a really fun ability to watch because it made every encounter with the villain a new challenge for the heroes, which would ultimately make for an exciting read. But for whatever reason, Reason, this power has basically been left in the dust, making Doomsday that much less unique from any other bruiser type villain, at least in my opinion. At number 6 we have Dr. Octopus. Something that the less avid readers may not know about this villain is that he's been going back and forth between heroism and villainy for some time now. And not only that, Otto Octavius has recently taken on the mantle of Spider-Man, donning the superior Spider-Man armor outfitted with the mechanical arms and everything. He's also been taken over by Venom recently, as well as the Carnage symbiote. Although he's known to be back to his evil ways and his classic suit in 2022, there is no telling if he'll jump back into the Spidey suit once more. He's already gone back and forth a number of times, even in the last few years, so I wouldn't be surprised if he did it again. At number 5 is the Green Goblin, aka Norman Osborn. As if this villain wasn't enough of a contender for Spidey to deal with before, he actually takes on the Carnage symbiote, turning him into the Red Goblin, as mentioned before. This makes him nearly unstoppable, forcing the good guys to employ anti-venom on him in order to 
take him out for good. And even though he has since gone back to being the Green Goblin, the character takes another turn that makes him unrecognizable from his past self during the events of Kindred Rising. And by unrecognizable, I mean that he's now working with Spider-Man. When Sin Eater cleanses Norman of his sins, his allegiance is changed and he becomes a hero. At number four, we have Doctor Doom. These days, Doctor Doom has taken on some pretty unstoppable powers that some would even describe as being godlike. Big fans of Victor Von Doom might have expected him to reach a point like this at some point because of his insatiable hunger for power, but as of 2022, he's already surpassed at least my expectations of what he was capable of. Although they haven't stuck around until the time that we're posting this, he has taken the powers of the Silver Surfer and even the Beyonder, giving him a whole new mantle of God Emperor Doom during the Secret Wars storyline. Just for scale, this gave Doctor Doom the ability to piece together broken pieces of the universe after the multiversal collapse. And that's a pretty crazy glow up if you ask me. And even if he doesn't hold quite that much power these days, Having had that ability has changed the character forever, if you ask me. At number three is the Crime Syndicate of America. So is it just me, or would an evil version of the Justice League make for a pretty cool and unique antagonistic presence in a live action DC project? As much as the evil doppelganger trope might be an old one, it still hasn't been tested out on the big screen in any major way yet, at least in the last 20 years. And when Marvel brought Civil War to the movies, it worked better than anyone might have expected. And that makes me think that heroes facing off against each other in the DCEU would really resonate with people right now. And with the crime syndicate coming from Earth 3, it could also open the door to more interdimensional conflicts. At number two, we have the Injustice League. As much as it might not make for the most focused movie, having a whole team of the most iconic DC villains would just be epic. And I know there's Suicide Squad, but I'm talking as like an antagonistic force to a main hero in their movie. But I digress. And I put this one higher on the list, not because it would be easy to pull off, but because if it were pulled off properly, it could be one of the more iconic efforts in the DCEU. To be honest, the only way I could see something like this really working to its fullest potential is if DC builds up their cinematic universe for another five years at least, and introduces each project's villain in a way that gives them all enough depth and hype that an appearance by the Injustice League would be invited, but we'll see. At number 10 is Despero. Although Despero has always been totally jacked, he was originally known as more of a threat to the Justice League through mind manipulation. During the Silver Age, he would only typically use his telepathic powers before anything else, but these days, it's a different story. Although these changes did start to take place way back in the 80s, the character has come a long way since the days when he would sit on his throne and twist his fingers most of the time. Now, he seems to do a lot of the grunt work himself, even looking larger in size these days than ever before. And even outside of the comics, Despero's appearance in the Arrowverse offers a totally different look into the villain. He takes on a human form for much of the time, who is, well, let's just say he's not as big as Despero, nor does he have much musculature to him, no offense to that actor. Nor does he have a third eye or anything that a comic book fan would expect. And when he's in proper form, he just seems a lot less demonic and cunning, more like Hellboy's very serious detective older brother or something like that. At number nine, we have Anton Arcane. The penultimate villain to Swamp Thing, Anton Arcane has always been a threat as one of the most prolific evil scientists in all of DC. But when Swamp Thing finally kills Anton during one of their many confrontations, back in 2016 I think, the villain goes to hell and basically becomes a demon. Having been a pretty tame foe for most of the Swamp Thing comics, Anton Arcane's physical changes have made him almost unrecognizable now that he's a demon. And what's worse is that he continues to bother Swamp Thing and his niece Abigail, but now with the added demonic powers in mind. So he's changed quite a bit, both in looks and power set. At number eight, we have Psycho Pirate. The way that this villain has changed since the Infinite Crisis event is unmatched. Although he looks relatively the same, he's gained such a power boost that he now works with the likes of Darkseid and Alexander Luther. After surviving the crisis, he comes out on top, getting his hands on what's known as the Medusa Mask. And what this helps him do is basically summon beings from the old multiverse. 
Curse, which as you can imagine is a very powerful ability, especially directly following the event itself. And even though he's been killed by Black Adam during the events of Blackest Night, Psycho Pirate's corpse is brought back to life as a Black Lantern. And as you can imagine, this gives him a whole new look and increases his power level. He loses the Medusa mask in this ghoulish form, but even without it, he appears totally different than how we're used to seeing him. Number 7. Null. Null existed long before even the Celestials in the 6th incarnation of the multiverse, where he existed in basically nothingness. But when the Celestials created the 7th multiverse, Null was mad that he got woken up, so he created the all black necro sword and beheaded a Celestial. For this insane feat of power, he was banished to a void, where he works on the sword and eventually he goes out into the universe killing various gods until he loses the necro sword to Gore the God Butcher after he's defeated by an unnamed god. He then goes on to make more and more symbiotes, yes like the symbiotes like Venom, who all shared a hive mind under the control of Null. They eventually rebel and imprison Null inside the symbiote homeworld Clintar. In the 2020 King in Black story, Null is brought to Earth and faces off against all the heroes. He's one of the strongest villains in Marvel. He is immortal, super strong, instantly heals, can create an unlimited amount of symbiotes made of the living abyss, some of which have been incredibly powerful on their own, and can control them all. The Silver Surfer had to use all the reserves of the Power Cosmic to just temporarily stop Null. Thor using the Power Cosmic and the Thor Force was no match for Null. He was awoken, enslaved, and controlled Celestials, and even defeated Sentry, ripping him in half and absorbing the Void. The only thing that defeated him was Eddie Brock's Venom wielding the Unipower, which is Captain Universe, the protector of the universe, and the opposite to everything pretty much Null represents. Number 6. Urizen. In the world of Image Comics Spawn, Urizen is a dark entity whose status rises above both heaven and hell. He existed since the dawn of time before either of the realms and was initially one of the elder gods of the universe. Urizen existed to provide balance to the universe in life and death. He consumed the souls of the living in order to maintain this balance. Now, as both heaven and hell sought to fight for the souls of the dead in order to wage war against each other, they both saw Urizen as a threat. They weirdly join forces in an act of desperation and seal the Elder God away so that they can keep fighting? I guess? Maybe I'm understanding it wrong, but basically, this primordial being can't be killed or defeated. It takes a literal act of heaven and hell to even lock it away. Once devils from hell unleash Yurzen, he begins a rampage in the modern time. As an elder god, Yurzen not only has limitless strength, but he can bend the fabric of reality and time, which is a level of power hard to even understand really. Even Spawn was defeated in his battle against the entity, but luckily death doesn't really mean anything to him and the undead warrior returns to the fight. But still, there's no way to actually kill Yurzen. Spawn's only hope is to seal the other god away for another inevitable rampage down the line. Number 5. The Chaos King. While he is relatively obscure, he is nothing to scoff at. Amatsu Mikabashi, first appearing in Thor Blood Oath number 6 in 2006, is the Japanese god of chaos, evil, and he was an aspect of the cosmic being Oblivion. Mikabashi ruled and thrived over the earth when it was nothing more than a formless void of primordial darkness. And as such, his goal now is to put an end to creation and bring about a new age of chaos and void. He is a primordial being who was imprisoned in Yomi, the Shinto underworld, where he remained for centuries accruing an army of Oni, which is Shinma demons, and other monsters and stuff like that. During the events of Ares God of War, Chaos King attacks Olympus after he had defeated and controlled the Japanese pantheon after the fall of Asgard during the Ragnarok event. This is what kickstarts his mission in Chaos War, where he slays the Egyptian gods, the Celtic gods, the Shi'ar gods, the gods of Zen Law. He takes out Nightmare in the Dream Dimension, destroys Mephisto, and casts Mistress Death out of Hell, making her literally run away. Oh, and he releases the souls of the damned. He has the power to defeat Eternity and is practically unfazed by attacks from the likes of Zeus, God Hercules, Galactus, Silver Surfer, and Thor could not defeat the Chaos King. To win, Hercules had to punch him into a portal to an endless void of nothingness, and this was after he had destroyed 98.76% of the universe. Damn. Number 4, Darkseid. In the new 52, Uxas, who would become Darkseid, whispers doubt into the ears of the gods, sending them into a war with each other, which is when he takes them out. 
and steals their power, making himself the first of the new gods, quote unquote. He has immeasurable strength. He is immortal, nearly invulnerable, surviving an explosion that could destroy existence. He wields the cosmic Omega effect, using Omega beams to hurt Superman and even the Spectre. He can remove people from existence and using the Omega sanction, he can trap people in an endless loop of increasingly horrible lives. Telepathically strong enough to control the population of a planet, he can use telekinesis, teleport, control the time stream and manipulate matter. He's super smart, has advanced technology and controls Apocalypse and the army of parents demons. But almost everything he does is through avatars he creates because he is the embodiment of evil. He can do anything he wants to and can never truly be defeated except for true form High Father. Darkseid's motivations are rather simple. Conquer and control all life by unlocking and solving the anti-life equation, something DC fans saw him actually achieve in last summer's final crisis. What makes him fun is that he chooses to manipulate events from the shadows, allowing his minions to act on his behalf, which always makes it more fun. At number one is the Batman who laughs. Enough with the downgrades, because this guy's change is a glow up if I've ever seen one. These days, the Batman who laughs has gained so much power that he's known to be basically godlike, and he finds these new powers in the place that he comes from, the Dark Multiverse. After finding a Dr. Manhattan powered Batman in the Dark Multiverse, the Batman who laughs gets his mind trained transferred into the body of that hero, acquiring the greater part of Dr. Manhattan's abilities, but with the sinister touch of his usual self as well. The only way that he's able to be taken down is when Wonder Woman finds a way to match his power level herself and defeats him despite his insane power boost.